Sandra Walters. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm going to be talking about the T-SQL T unit testing framework for SQL. Who do I am? Who do I think I am for believing that I'm qualified to stand here telling you about this? I'm a local full stack developer. I've been working with Microsoft SQL in the 1990s when it was version 4.21. And I discovered T-SQL T about a year ago. Before that, when I tested against SQL, I usually wrote it in whatever language I was developing the front end in, C Sharp, Scala, Scala. T-SQL T allows you to write your unit tests in SQL, the native language. You can test your stored procedures, you can test your functions. If you're on DBA, you may want to test more, and I will be demonstrating how to do that. But first, I'd like to give a little sales pitch on unit testing in general. <laughs> There's always one in the crowd. There's always someone, whatever team you're on, doesn't necessarily believe unit tests is a good thing. So I promise I will keep that short. This is almost 2018. We're all professionals. We know that testing is important. So hopefully all of you are already convinced unit tests are valuable. <coughs> Then I'll show how you can use T-SQL T in Management Studio. A Redgate has a wonderful tool called SQL Test that finds the unit tests for you and has a very nice interface. You can run it yourself. Or if you don't have uh, SQL Test, you can just run uh, the stored procedures that they provide for that purpose. I'll show both ways. I'm going to show how you can set up your Visual Studio projects to use T-SQL T, whether or not you are using SSDT or ReadyRoll. Now, ReadyRoll Core is available in Visual Studio 2017 Enterprise, but ReadyRoll Professional is a much more fully featured tool by Redgate. Each one takes a different approach to how to structure the solution, and both uh, we'll work with T-SQL T just fine with the T-SQL T test adapter, which I'll demonstrate. I'm also going to show how to set up your VSTS builds such that you can execute your T-SQL T unit tests over the course of the build process. And if there's time, I'll demonstrate how you can determine what your code coverage level is with a product called T-SQL, with a product called SQL Cover. It's actually not a product, it's open source. Why should we unit test? One word, money. These figures came from a book that was released in 2012 by some gentleman who worked at Google. Uh, I've got a source, the source down there. It's kind of small, tiny print. The book's name was How Google Tests Software. It was written by three gentlemen who were involved in testing. One of them was the director of the Chrome testing process. Another one was a unit testing uh, engineer. And the third guy was a software developer in test. Now, I say that because he was a developer who got assigned to the test group, which most of us wouldn't really be fond of. Most of us as software developers would prefer to write line of business code. And yet, we're the ones that are the most qualified to write the unit test because six months to a year down the road, some poor schmuck is going to come in and look at the code and wonder, what in the world was this guy thinking? That poor... Exactly. One thing unit tests provide us is a baseline. They also they provide a sanity check. They set the expectation for what is this function supposed to do? And what the fine folks at Google discovered was if you find a bug and fix it at the unit test stage, five bucks average. If you wait until the system test stage, it's a thousand times as expensive in terms of people's time. So hopefully that's all the convincing you need. The usual way, though, that we've run our SQL unit tests is testing the code on a copy of production data made a year ago not kept in sync with schema changes. How many of us have done that? 
Data changes made by tests are not isolated from each other. What one unit test does, another one comes in and stomps all over it, and when you try to run this entire set again, things go haywire. Manual test testing done once, if ever, at the end of the sprint, usually by some poor guy, not even automated. Monolithic custom test process built in a front-end language. Uh, my, his, my history has usually been that kind of approach before I found T-SQL 2. Wait until after the code is written, cobble something together, test a bunch of independent, interdependent processes at once, or have the intern do it, how hard can it be? A lot of us think of unit tests as an afterthought, but there is a push for test-driven development. Write the unit test either first or at the same time as the code, because that way it's fresh in your mind, and you're setting the baseline, you know what you need to achieve, and writing the unit test allows you to, first, allows you to write your code in such a way that you can achieve it more easily. So, we've all seen this meme, right? We've all worked with this guy. Don't be this guy. So, that's it for the elevator pitch on unit tests. What is T-SQL T? It's a unit testing framework, especially for Microsoft SQL. It's been around since 2008, but I've found that it doesn't have a lot of visibility yet among the developer community. <clears throat> I only learned about it about a year ago. However, Redgate has thrown their weight behind it. They've got the SQL test product for it. It's, it appears to be gaining a lot of momentum. And the two developers behind it, uh, one of whom is a PhD, uh, are they're very active in the community, they're active in Stack Overflow, very responsive. And I really think that T-SQL-T is the way to go as far as unit testing for SQL is concerned. There are some other products out there. There's uh, DBFit, which is not a native SQL product. There's another one called uh, T-SQL Unit, which doesn't appear to have the momentum that T-SQL-T is developing. T-SQL T works with Microsoft SQL 2005 SP2 and up, regardless of the additions. The unit tests and the asserts that you write and that T-SQL T supports are all written in SQL. All of your tests are run within transactions. Each unit test that T-SQL T executes starts with a transaction. Everything you do is in the context of that transaction. And then the whole thing is rolled back at the end. So anything you do over the course of the unit test, say you drop a table, you drop constraints, those don't stay. It provides support for fake tables and views, and it provides something called stored procedure spies, which are something along the lines of a mock, except with some additional features. So I'll be demonstrating these things shortly. If you want to get T-SQL T and check it out for yourself, go to tsqlt.org. There's a little sidebar on the side. Download a zip file. It's got five files inside of it. The license, some examples, release notes. Set CLR enabled. It does come with a CLR. There's only five functions exposed in that CLR, most of which are for prettifying the output. One of them is called new connection. And new connection is for crazy stuff that we sometimes see that establishes new connections over the course of the stored procedure. Open ROSAP, bulk import, things like that. Because it has a CLR that does this kind of thing, <clears throat> it may be a security concern for you. However, uh, the, the designers of T-SQL T have provided an external access key that you can install and use if you need it. These are the assert methods available in the T-SQL C schema. As you can see, a lot of them look like what we're familiar with, with high-level languages. There's assert equals, there's assert like. But some of these are specifically designed to work with tables and result sets. Assert empty table. Is the table empty? The assert passes. Does it have records? The assert fails. Assert equals table. 
pass it the name of two different tables. Are they exactly the same, not only the metadata, but the contents? If they're the same, the assert passes. Assert equals table schema. Just look at the schema. Are the two tables the same? Based on the schema, it passes. Assert result sets have same metadata. Perhaps you need to compare result sets and not tables. This is how you do it. In this case, it just looks at the metadata, not, not the contents. And there's also fail. If you need to immediately make your unit test fail, well, you call fail. That's what it's for. This is how we define T SQL T unit tests. T SQL T has the, con the, the terminology of test class is a schema. So there are stored procedures T SQL T provides to create your test class. But remember, this is simply a schema. Now, the reason you have to go through the new test class in order to create it is because it adds an extended property against the schema. This is how T SQL T can go find your unit tests later. It looks through all the schemas. Oh, this schema has this extended stored property. It must have unit tests inside it. Once you have your schema set up, you create your unit tests in that test class or that schema. They must start with the word test. That's simply by convention. These are the things that T SQL T will be looking for when you execute your, when you execute your unit tests. Just like with many other unit testing frameworks, such as NUnit, for example, you can create a test setup stored procedure if you've got utility methods or processes that are common to a bunch of unit tests. Just put it in the setup. The setup will get executed before each unit test in that schema. If you've installed SQL test, you get this nice little user interface and it will automatically find all of your unit tests inside your database. I will show how to run unit tests with and without SQL test. But first, I'd like to say a few words about this wonderful sample database I'll be using tonight, Wide World Importers. Has anyone here ever heard of AdventureWorks? It's old, it's old, like my son would say. Older than dirt, you're older than dirt, mom. Thanks. I will remember that on Christmas Day. AdventureWorks doesn't show off a lot of the newer SQL features. Wide World Importers was released in 2016 with the express purpose of demonstrating a lot of SQL's newer features. It's got query store, it's got column store, it's got temporal tables. You can even see a few of them in the screenshot here if you have good eyes. It's got in memory tables. Anyone here use Oracle? You know what, you know what sequences are. Microsoft SQL has them too, and they have had them for years. Another uh, database that you can find, I've got the source, the github.com source, where you can find Wide World Importers. There's another associated database, Wide World Importers DW, that demonstrates a lot of the data warehousing features. For example, Polybase. SSIS is, I wouldn't say replacement, but kind of. So if you're into databases, if you like trying out new tools, definitely check this out. So on to the demo. <coughs> T SQL T comes with a sample, but it's very simplistic. Um, there's a walkthrough on the website, tsqlt.org. I'm not going to demonstrate the sample. I'm going to demonstrate some unit tests that I have written against wide world importers. Please feel free to ask me any questions you might have during the demo. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yes. What's the wallet impact? The wallet impact is free. It's open source. You can find it on GitHub. Free, the yes, thing? the whole thing. Uh, T SQL T is a set of stored procedures and a CLR and tables. The UI I showed was SQL Test. It's a user interface that 
Redgate has written to support T-SQL T. That's right, it's an extension for SSMS. Unfortunately, SQL Test is not free, but T-SQL T, the framework itself, is open source. Oh, I think it's 300 something. It's, there's actually, there's another product out there. I think it's called DB Unit that's half the price, but I haven't used it, so I couldn't really say uh, what the quality is. That's not too bad. Okay, I've got a series of unit tests in my database and I'm going to run all of them at once. So can everyone see the, is the um, screen visible? Fairly visible? I could put this in a lower resolution if necessary. Okay. If I want to run all the tests at once, I run tsql t.runall. It executes all of my unit tests that it finds. And any output that my unit tests have go at the top right there. <coughs> Directly below that is the text exec test execution summary. It shows me what it found, how long it took to run, and what the result was. So you can see here, I've got three separate schemas. I've divided up my unit tests pretty much by purpose. BizLogic tests, constraint tests, unit tests. Something I've found in the past few years is that a DBA's idea of what a unit test should be varies wildly from what a full stack developer's idea of a unit test would be. So the nice thing about T-SQL-T is that it supports all of them. I might want to test a stored procedure. A DBA might want to test a constraint. I'm not sure what's going on with the video there. But. T SQL T provides methods that you can test constraints, you can test triggers, you can test stored procedures, all kinds of different, different things. So, I want to create a new test class, configuration tests. T SQL T new test class. Let's go take a look at the schema it just created. Let's go all the way down here, refresh my schemas list. There's configuration tests. If I look at the properties, extended properties, you see it has this property here, T SQL T dot test class. That's how it that's how T SQL T knows this schema may have unit tests in it. This is good for troubleshooting. If for some reason your unit test is not getting executed, you might want to go take a look at this. Perhaps the schema got created in such a way that the property did not get applied. Now I've got a unit test I'm going to create. This is a very, very simple unit test against an equally simple stored procedure. Here, let's get rid of that red squiggly. IntelliSense, refresh local cache. That should go away because the unit test has been created. Sometimes it takes a moment. I did execute this, didn't I? I did execute it. So, if you're familiar with unit tests, you know that they have three parts, arrange, act, and assert. The arrange portion of your unit test is where you set up the conditions. The act is the portion where you exercise the method under test. And the assert is the section that checks if it actually worked. So up at the top here, I've got my arrange section. I am declaring a couple of variables. I'm setting them to some values. And then I run my stored procedure that I want to test. After that, I check to see if it actually worked. 
Now, I can tell you right away, this unit test is not a good unit test. I've got hard-coded values in it. You don't really want to do that in the real world. If someone takes this unit test and puts it on another server with the same database, it will probably fail. What is going on with the video? That's odd. It will probably fail because it's relying on a username of Franklin and a role of external sales. What if these don't exist? So the next unit test I'll show you, and the unit test after that, we'll be, we'll be working with some fake tables. This unit test, we've got some hard-coded values. It's simply to demonstrate what you can do. If I want to run this unit test, exec t sql t dot run configuration tests test that add role member if non-existent as user to role. Let's pull this up a little bit. Okay, you can see it succeeded. What exactly succeeded? I called the stored procedure. I passed it my hard-coded role name and my hard-coded username. So all that stored procedure does is put this user into that role. I then check to see, did the user really get placed in the role? And assert equals takes an expected value, an actual value, and compares them. And if they're not the same, it prints out the error message, and the assert will fail. Super simple. Any questions so far? Yes. Um, with that kind of scenario, you would probably want to install T SQL T in both databases. It is relatively lightweight. Well, it requires schemas that belong to a user that has the rights to run certain elements in master, as well as pretty much whatever it needs to run within the current database. They don't have to be, it doesn't have to be the DBO though. Right. It, could be the DBO. it could be the DBO, that is correct. Really? That's very odd. Is this a production database or a testing? Well, here's the thing. You wouldn't typically be unit testing inside your production database. Uh, the typical shop would have production, you'd have development, each individual developer might have their own copy so that if you have multiple developers they're not stomping on each other's work. If you have to ask whether your database has open enough security to allow you to install T SQL T on it, then that's probably the wrong place. Unit testing is not generally done in production. It's done further back. Yeah, yeah. So when I show how to set up your SSDT projects, I've got them actually split into four separate pieces because unit, the unit test piece is not typically pushed to production. Okay. Okay, let's look at a much more real world example of a unit test. Here I've got a unit test. Test change password will throw exception on incorrect old password. What I want to exercise here is a stored procedure that comes with wide world importers that attempts to change a person's password. However, in order to do so, they must provide a valid hash of the current password. And I'm testing an edge case. The edge case I want to test for is I'm going to pass in the wrong current password, and I want to make sure that this will fail. So I do a fair bit of setup ahead of time, up in the Arrange section. I'm using the ID of a known test account, and I want to find a password that I can be reasonably sure is not the user's current password. 
So I grab their logon name. The front end shouldn't allow me to set my password to the current login name. Therefore, using the current login name, it should be an invalid password. If either of those cases are true, I'm going to call tsqlt.fail. If I don't find the test account, it fails. If it just so happens that the current hash password that I chose to test with is the user's password now, I'm also going to fail. What I want to see here is that change password throws an exception if it receives a bad current password. So I'm using a method here, t sql t dot expect exception. This tells t sql t sometime between this point and the end of my unit test, something needs to throw this exception. If it doesn't throw the exception, it's a failure. I can optionally give it an expected error number, and that's what I'm doing here because I happen to know that this stored procedure is going to throw 51,000 if it detects a bad old password. So in this case, I don't need an assert because expect exception takes care of that for me. So I'm going to, exec I'm going to execute just this one unit test. And you can see their success. But what happens if I change this unit test to not expect the exception? Let's go update this and run it again. So now I've just changed the unit test not to expect the exception. What happens when I run the unit test? It fails. Not only does it fail, but it throws the exception. And you see T sql T here is complaining about a rollback error. What this means is T sql T assumes that you may have had your own transaction in the unit test, and it tries to roll that back first. So there was a rollback error. That's not really something you need to be concerned about. It just means I'm not using my own transaction. I don't need to have that rolled back. Let's restore this. So I put the expect exception back in. I ran the unit test again. It's fine. This is a much more complex unit test. Here, I'm doing what I should do and I'm going to be faking some tables out. This unit test is so complex, in fact, that I've got a setup for it. Let's close up the security section. So it's in a schema called unit tests, and I wrote a corresponding unit test.setup method. We're going to be faking some tables. Fake table creates a copy of the given table with no constraints. I'm not sure what's going on with the screen. That's very odd. No constraints, optionally no identities, no computed columns, no defaults. This makes it much easier to insert test data. If you have a complex set of interrelation, interrelationships on your tables, it can sometimes be difficult to mock that, but T-SQL-T makes it easy with the fake table method. So I'm faking out a series of four tables. I'm also calling tsql.t.fake function. That one works a little bit differently. If I want to fake a function, I need to have a replacement written already. So you can see here, here, let me see if I can increase the size just a little bit. Get this out of the way. Oh, boy. 
You can see here I'm passing fake function two parameters. The first is the name of the function I want to fake, and the second is the name of the function I'm replacing it with. I've already created website dot fake calculate customer price. I can show you the differences here. There are two very, very different uh, functions. Calculate customer price is very complex. It goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. If I run this in my unit test, I'm not isolating the stored procedure I'm testing. Because I have all this code in this function, this could go wrong, and that affects the unit test that I'm trying to exercise against a separate stored procedure. So. I have a fake calculate customer price. Boom! It's always going to be 1111.1111. Much easier to test with. After I've set up my fakes, I insert some test data. And this is what my unit tests in this schema are going to be working with. So I've got. I've got a flaky video. I've got Jim Bob in the people table, Martian lander and stock items, and a testy customer. My test here, test insert customer orders, creates expected records. I'm exercising a stored procedure. Let's go way to the bottom here. A stored procedure here. What this does is create customer orders. It takes a couple of variables, orders and order lines. I'm creating them up here. And they are table variables, user-defined variables. I am filling them with data right here based on some things that I'm pulling out of my fake tables. After I have everything set up, I call website.insertCustomerOrders. And then I also have to do a little bit more work in order, to, in order to test whether or not this succeeded. This is still relatively simple for a unit test as far as real world testing goes. All I'm doing is checking to see that three orders got inserted into my fake table. So test order count. I get the count from sales.orders, where comments equals that test order comment that we saw up here. I'm just verifying that three rows were entered with this comment. I call tsql t.assert equals. I pass it the test count. Oh, wait, this one actually is looking at the return value, excuse me. The insert customer orders returns a value, and it needs to be zero to indicate success. So that's the first thing I check for. Is it zero? Yes. This passed? No. Print out this error message. And then I call assert equals on the test order count. It better be three or else something went wrong. So let's run this unit test. Tsql t dot run. Put the name of the unit test in quotes and run. Okay, it looks like it failed. Something went wrong. I suspect this might have to do with the setup I did. One thing I'd like to mention, I kind of glossed over this earlier. If you have any object in your database that has schema binding, then you may need to drop that while you're creating your fake tables. 
the Wide World Importers Database has a schema binding object associated with a security policy. They're trying to show off how you can get really fancy with your security policies. And it's got a schema binding against the sales.customers table such that it checks your user account, determines what roles you're in, and if you're not in certain roles, you can't see some of the rows in sales.customers. So I'm dropping the security policy before I fake out the tables, otherwise it's going to have problems. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on troubleshooting what I did, just to point out that uh, unit tests uh, unit tests can throw exceptions, and you end up having to debug them. There is one more unit test I'd like to show, but perhaps this would be a good time to switch over to SQL test. SQL test is the interface from Redgate. It automatically detects I have unit tests in three databases here. Right now we're looking at wide world importers. So let's open that up. These are all the unit tests it found. I can run it from here instead of through a script. And it's showing me that unit test failed. That's the one I just got. But everything else is passing. SQL test also has uh, something that I think is pretty cool. It's called SQL COP. It's a set of stored procedures that analyzes your database for uh, tuning improvements that you can make. It's, I believe it's over 40 unit tests. I can add these right now. There we go. And now we've got a bunch of additional unit tests here. And if I run them all, some of them are going to fail. I know I don't have this database tuned properly. For example, database and log files on the same disk. For each one that fails, it will give you a little bit of advice over on the right-hand side. For more information, go check out this, this link. Decimal size problem. For more information, go check out this link right here. Just like having a DBA looking over your shoulder saying, you're doing it wrong. Like, yeah, that's never happened to me, really. Okay, let's go take a look at a couple of more stored procedures I've got here I'd like to show. Test reseed all sequences reseeds the expected number of sequences. Here we're going to use a feature of T-SQL T called spy procedure. What this does is it sets up a mock of a stored procedure. While that stored procedure gets called, any calls to it get logged in a table that lives only for the lifetime of your unit test. So I'm spying this stored procedure right here. So a table gets created with the name of that stored procedure plus underscore spy procedure log. Every time that stored procedure gets called, a row is written to the table. The row will have a little bit of information. For example, there's going to be a column for every parameter that gets passed to it. You can query that table for information. And in fact, that's what I'm doing here. I've got a method in Wide World Importers, reseed all sequences, and it is calling reseed sequence beyond table values. This unit test is simply a sanity check. I expect it to call that stored procedure 28 times. If it doesn't, something's wrong. So after receipt all sequences is called, I take a look at the contents of the spy procedure log. I get a count of the records from it. If it wasn't called the right number of times, I throw an assert message.
Let's change this to 26. I'm going to modify this. Then I'm going to run this unit test. And we see this one failed. It was not called the expected number of times, expected 26, but instead got 28. Let's go ahead and fix it. Now I'd like to take a few minutes to look at the constraint tests section. These are the kinds of unit tests you might be interested in if you're a DBA. This too has a setup. I'm setting up some fake tables. Remember, the fake table will not have any constraints applied to it. So if I want to test a particular constraint, what I do is I call t sql t apply constraint and I give it the name of the table as well as the name of the constraint that I want to apply. So this way I can selectively control which constraints will go against the table for the course of the unit test. I've got a separate unit test for each one of these constraints. Test FK warehouse stock items application people. What this unit test is doing is it's going to exercise that constraint. I am going to try to insert a row in it with an invalid people ID, and that constraint better prevent this from happening. So I put this inside a try and a catch. I grab the error message, and that error message better be something along the lines of this constraint isn't going to allow it. So if the error message does not have that constraint name in it, something went wrong, and I call t sql t dot fail. So if I go back to SQL test, we see that the constraints are actually, uh, they're all working correctly. Yes? So in this case, you did a try catch. That's and right. In the previous case, you did uh, expect exception. Yes. Why would you choose one methodology over the other? Uh, the reason I'm doing that in this particular case is because I want to grab the text of the error message and take a look at a particular text, check it for a particular text. But you're right, you could just as easily use expect exception. There's multiple ways of checking for the results depending on what approach you'd like to use. Let's take a look at Visual Studio and see how I would set this up if I'm using SSDT projects. So I've got the Solution Explorer over here on the side. I've got a worldwide importer solution. This is awfully tiny. You may not be able to see it, so take my word for it. There's four SSDT projects here. Um, I've also pulled in some other items. There's a couple of uh, .NET projects that are made available with the Wide World Importers database simply to exercise some of the stored procedures within that database. But what I'd like to concentrate on is looking at how to set up your SSDT projects. So I've got T SQL T framework in its own project. I've got data load simulation uh, stored procedures that come with wide world importers in their own project. This is, this is the kind of thing that you might want to use in testing, but you wouldn't want to put on your production server. I've got WWI.DB schema. These are the main business objects, sales, orders, people. These would need to get pushed to any database where this application would live. Finally, I've got my unit tests in their own project. 
You know, this text is so tiny, I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint slides. I've got a couple of slides that probably show this a little bit better. Uh, might be a little bit easier to see. The idea here is that with composite projects, you've got your schemas split out in a suitable way such that you're not forced to deploy all of them to each database. I might not update, I might install T-SQL T and then never update it. So why would I need to keep that in the same project with the things that have to be pushed all the time? Unresolved references. You may be familiar with the SQL error 71502. This happens if you have tables or stored procedures that are referring to things that aren't in your project. Like, for example, this one, unit tests dot test customer orders has an unresolved reference to an object. That's because those objects are in a different SSDT project. So you add a database reference and you set the referred project's location as same database. You can run your unit tests directly from Visual Studio. There's a test adapter written by a really, really smart guy who's not only written the T-SQL T test adapter, he's also written SQL cover, which checks for code coverage with T-SQL T unit tests. There's a version of the test adapter for both Visual Studio 2015 and 2017. Unfortunately, if you're stuck working with 2013, you're out of luck. Hopefully none of us are still doing that. Okay. Um, in order to run your unit tests, though, these are T-SQL to unit tests. They have to be run on SQL. So you must give the test adapter a database connection for it to connect to SQL and run your unit tests. So let's flip back to Visual Studio. I know it's a little bit smaller, but I can at least show how all of that is done. You can see I've got Test Explorer over here on the left. It's got a bunch of nice little green icons here. Let's open this up just a little bit. I might hide the solution. Explore all together just for a moment. You know, it, it actually might, but I hardly ever use magnifier, so. Okay. This is what a run settings file looks like. It's simply an XML file. It has a test database connection string with a connection string like what you would see in your app config. So I go into the test menu, test settings, select test settings file. And this is how I tell Visual Studio's test explorer where to find my database. And once again, insert customer orders is failing. You'll see here, not run tests. It does detect the fact that I have a set of test classes. So it shows the test classes or the schemas here, but they're not actual unit tests. They can't be run. Uh, I did read a forum. Uh, the gentleman who wrote the test adapter, his name is Ed Elliott, in the forum he says, yep, that's just the way it works. So it's obviously not a big concern of his. It's no big deal, really. They're just there. <coughs> Let's take a look at how to build this in Visual Studio. Anybody else here use Visual Studio with uh, VSTS? Awesome. So here's my build definition. You can see it's pretty much plain vanilla until we get down here toward the bottom. There's a SQL package call. 
via a command line. It's kind of, kind of difficult to read, maybe if you're in the back, but what this is doing is it's calling SQL package, it's taking my wwi.unitests uh, DAC pack, which is what SSTT builds, and it's pushing that off to a database. So every time this build runs, it's going to compare my unit tests in my project against what is on that database and update it if it's out of date. After that, we've got a VS test task. And you can see here, I've got my test assemblies set to point at SQL files. Scroll down a little bit. I also have to specify a run settings file here too. So if I flip back to Visual Studio, you'll see if I bring up the Solution Explorer, I've actually got two run settings files over here as part of my solution. I've got one for localhost and one for the build server. So that way, while I'm just de developing over the course of my day's work, developing, running, testing, I'm doing that against my local database. But once it goes up to the build server, it will use a different database to run the unit tests for the build process. Last, but most important, I have to tell VS Test where it can find that test adapter. There's actually three ways that I can point VS Test toward my test adapter. Now remember, these are T SQL T unit tests. They are not intrinsically testable by VS Test. So I have to point it at the T SQL T test adapter that I have installed in Visual Studio. I can either install it as a NuGet package, but remember SSDT projects, you can't install a NuGet package into those. So you either have to create a dummy project and add the test adapter to it, or add the test adapter to another .NET project in your solution, which feels a little weird. Why are we adding this test adapter to a project that doesn't need it? But the nice thing about NuGet is it's so easily updatable. Every time Ed Elliott makes a push to T the T SQL T test adapter, all you have to do is go update your NuGet packages. You get the new version. If you really, really don't like adding your test adapter in a NuGet package to a project that will never use it, well, if you've got control over your build server, you can just install the test adapter there and call it a day. Just put it in a folder and point this path to custom test adapters to that folder and it will find the test adapter for you that way. But you're on your own as far as updating it goes. You could also, if you don't want to work in either of those ways, you could also take the test adapter and put it in a folder in your solution but that takes, that takes up space in your source control repository. That's probably the worst choice out of the three. Okay, let's take a look at what this looks like when it runs. Uh, my build server is actually an Azure instance. It's very, very, very slow. So I'm not going to bore you watching it run, but here's what the output looks like. You can see here, we're looking at the logs on the VS test process. And there's a whole bunch of lines here for past, and then the name of the T SQL T unit test. At the end, total tests 12, pasts 12. And I can also switch over to the test screen here. Get a nice little graph there. I can sort by the failed tests, the past tests, and so on and so forth. Any questions so far? Everybody's so quiet. No questions. The code coverage report. 
Let's jump ahead. This is actually the, the product of two separate pieces. SQL Cover, which by the way is on GitHub. Uh, a number of these things I'm showing tonight are open source. SQL Cover produces um, an output which is, I believe it's an XML format called Open Cover. So the, the Open Cover output is taken by another tool which also is open source, called Report Generator, which turns it into index.htm. I've got it on my local uh, hard drive. If you would like to see SQL Cover in action, there's really not a lot of interesting things to it. It's, uh, <coughs> it's just a DLL with a PowerShell script. So. takes a while to run because it's connecting to the database, it's exercising all of the unit tests, it's throwing that output into this results folder, and then preparing, preparing the report. And this is what the report looks like. I actually was curious, what is considered code coverage for this kind of thing? So I grabbed the source control uh, I grabbed the source off the of GitHub for SQL Cover. And I'm going to jump ahead way, way toward the end. I actually had a few things to show about this. SQL Cover is using the SQL Server API to determine what's coverable. There's a method in basically the uh, the meat of SQL Cover, a method that checks every statement that is parsed from the SQL Server API. And way down at the bottom was this can be covered method. If it's a begin end block, it can't be covered. If it's a try catch, it can't be covered, and so on and so forth. It's skipping some of the more unimportant things. Okay, I've also got a ready roll solution I would like to show. Has anyone even heard of ready roll besides just a few of us? Yeah. <laughs> ready roll is a product from Redgate. There's two versions, Core and Pro. Core comes with Visual Studio 2017 Enterprise and Pro is part of Redgate's larger SQL Tools product. I believe the entire tool sets, set is $3,000. So if you've already got Visual Studio, you might try out Core. It's a SQL within a project than SSDT is. Yeah, I, I don't know that it's been um, upgraded recently, but I've been using uh, SSDT within Visual Studio 2017, and I haven't seen a lot of problems. Actually, I've seen more problems in ReadyRoll than SSDT. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's pin Solution Explorer down. Now with ReadyRoll, I've got a single project here with my database schema in it, www.dbschema.core. ReadyRoll takes a migration-based approach to database modeling. It's at the other end of the spectrum than SSDT is. With SSDT, you have your schema divided out into your tables, your stored procedures. Each one of these gets their own file. But with ReadyRoll, the files are organized as migration objects. So when you first create your ReadyRoll project, 
it connects up to your database and imports the objects into into a script. You can choose to split that script out into multiple scripts, but they are ultimately migration scripts as opposed to table-based scripts, scripts, and so on. And they are executed, if I were to push this against another database, they are executed in order of, of number. Each one of these, also following convention, has to start with a number in the name. So. My ready roll projects here, project here starts with WWI recreate query store, recreate objects, and so on and so forth. Until I get toward the end, I've got install T-SQL T, and that's where my T-SQL T framework lives. And then I've got recreate unit test schemas, and I've got recreate unit tests. So it is a different approach, but what I found interesting was that if you go check out uh, Redgate blogs, uh, the folks that came up with ReadyRoll are, they almost have a, a religious belief that migration-based modeling is the way to go. And they had some very uh, interesting arguments for it. Uh, so if that's the kind of thing you're interested, give ReadyRoll a try. I'm going to bounce back here to my VSTS builds because I also put together a build definition for the ReadyRoll project, which is actually in a different repository altogether. You can see I had a fair bit of trouble with it because this is still a little raw. Um, Redgate has some tasks that they've written for Visual Studio that don't necessarily work. But the nice thing is the T-SQL T adapter does work. And it finds the unit tests in the ReadyRoll project just like it did with the SSTT project. So down here I've got run T-SQL T unit tests, and it found my unit tests, and it ran them. So if I look at the tests here, this is actually a different database. I didn't have quite as many unit tests in here, so you can see there's only nine unit tests. But the T-SQL T test adapter found them and ran them, and life is good. Any questions at this point? Cool. Well, it works, but not with the ReadyRoll test tasks. Um, I was speaking to uh, Rob Richardson about this earlier. There's a test task that they've released that will run the T-SQL to unit tests for you. However, it's at version 0 0.7, and it seems a little bit buggy. There's a forum thread going on about what's wrong with it on Stack Overflow, but nobody really has a resolution yet. Um, on the other hand, the guy who wrote the T-SQL T test adapter, he's super responsive. Um, I left him some feedback, and he got back to me within three hours on a Saturday. So I was really impressed with that. And his test adapter works great. Okay, I'm going to bounce back into the PowerPoint presentation. And we've actually uh, covered a lot of the material I had. I was saving SQL cover for last because code coverage kind of bores people. But I did want to point out one important thing. Martin Fowler, he's a very well-known gentleman in our industry. This was shamelessly stolen from his website. He wrote a blog article about what code coverage should be about. I've got a reference down, down there at the bottom of the screen. Coverage is not so much about hitting a quality target as it is about finding untested code. If management has given us a target of 80% coverage, something's wrong with this picture. 
we need to be focusing on not hitting a number, but simply, simply making our tests better, finding the pieces of our code that need to be exercised as a sanity check. If we're in a large group of developers, we don't want to be checking in code that is going to break Jim Bob's code that he checked on yesterday. And if that's uh, if there aren't any more questions, I just want to leave, I just want to leave you with one final thought. T is equal T. Oh, there is a question. Actually, that's per script. You can configure a script to not deploy against a particular target. Oh. Yeah. So, T SQL T gives us a chance to do this. Unit test all the things. You may not want necessarily need to unit test every single thing, but at least now you can unit test your T SQL code. And I've got one final slide. T SQL T is found at tsqlt.org. Here are a few other useful resources for T SQL T. Sure. I will put it up. Excellent. I'll post that link down here. Okay. Um, I've been gradually putting the information that I presented tonight up in a blog, and my goal was eventually to have um, the unit tests I wrote for Wide World Importers there as well. It's just not quite there yet. So that's the idea. It's an awfully quiet group tonight. Yes, it has been a long wait. <laughs> well, I've worked with a developer named Jim, and you and I have both worked with a developer named Bob. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I want to be included. Well, that was really fun. Wow. Good job. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Did you cover view testing views? I did not cover testing views, but you can fake views just like you can fake uh, some of the other objects. Uh, can you describe the kind of scenario that you're thinking of? Would you be draw would you be selecting from a view and importing into the table or Well, T SQL T isn't really intended to test performance per se. It's intended to test the results. Is are the results what you intended? So what you might do there in that scenario is you might want to be testing is the view coming up with the right metadata? Uh, so perhaps you might want to do an assert equals table uh, to take a look at the metadata from the view. Is this matching the metadata that you're trying to go into the table? So, yes. Yes, as a matter of fact, the test output will show you the duration of okay. each unit test. In fact, I, I can pull that up. 
and I've lost my mouse cursor again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I keep doing that over and over again. So, let's just open a new query window. I do not know what's going on with the video there. So, when the tests run, you get the test name. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, it's now finding all of my T-SQL, all of my SQL cop T-SQL t-tests. So it's going to run a little longer. It's going to take a little longer. Way down at the bottom, we're going to have this output. But one of the columns in the output is the duration in milliseconds. So it might give you a little information about performance, but that isn't really what T-SQL-T is about. It's, about. it's about checking the results. Are they what you intended them to be? 